there are a couple of other things worth having a look at on the uh, coefficients table. Um, one of them is the, the beta, the, which is the standardized regression coefficients. This is a good way of actually just comparing how important each individual um, predictive variable is um, overall to the model. So basically to have a look at the, the effect sizes, um, how influential each uh, predictive variable is at, at predicting big changes in the outcome variable. Um, as you can see, really, there's only one sort of standout um, predictive variable, which is age 11 standard marks. I mean, the, we saw before that those two were highly correlated, so it's not surprising in a way, but it, it, it looks as if um, compared to the other predictive variables, um, age, age 11 standard marks is, is by far the strongest predictor of, of changes in age 14 standard marks. Um, and that that is true, That that's important to state, but it's also important to note that um, a lot of these other predictive variables still have a st statistically significant impact on the um, age 14 predicted um, outcome. So if we, we can look at the T statistics and the significance levels to look for values uh, less than zero, uh, 0 0.05 and we can see that actually there are very very few which aren't statistically significant. Um, the contrast, uh, the the, the, the difference between predicting a score of someone's white British and Bangladeshi um, isn't statistically significant, neither is it between white British and mixed heritage. And I think there's another one which is borderline, which is the difference between the lowest um, social economic class group, which is long-term unemployed, and the one just above it, uh, routine occupations. Uh, but generally, all of the predictive variables are um, statistically significant. They are um, their influence on the model is statistically significant. So it's important to, to check that and to work out, of course, which one is the most important one using this beta. Um, we've also got these two extra sort of sets of columns here, which um, if you remember, we requested from the, um, I think it was the statistics options uh, when we were, we were running the regression analysis. Um, the 95% confidence interval for B is, um, the sort of the upper and lower bounds for which we can be 95% confident that the value for B that we calculated from our model um, actually lies. So there's always going to be some error in the calculation of these um, of these regression coefficients. But as you can see, we can be quite 95% confident that the one we've calculated. Uh, which is sort of halfway between these two actually does lie somewhere between these two. Um, so you, taking, for example, um, age 11 standardized scores, we, we, we got a coefficient of 0.842 and, you know, we can be 95% confident that, 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 that the value actually does lie between 0.834 and 0.849. So it's actually a very small interval where we're, we're, we're fairly happy that we haven't made an error there because the the interval for the conf the confidence interval isn't isn't large and um, the other thing I won't actually speak too much about partly because I don't sort of fully understand the technicalities of but these collinearity statistics are a good way of of looking for problems with multicollinearity so we've all all already looked at that sort of huge um correlation matrix with all the predictive variables in it but the, these collinearity statistics are sort of a way to I guess flag up problems um, with multicollinearity so if we're basically we're looking for values of the tolerance which are less than 10 and that's all of them by far so we're, we're happy that there's not a multicollinearity problem if, if these values are less than 10 and um, VIFs which is variance inflation factor of that the are close to one, so most of these are close to one. But you see, there are a few um, of the predictor variables, the, the dummy variables for um, some of the social economic class, and I think uh, one of the. Oh uh, no, I'd probably just say it, these are all close enough to one. So it's the social economic class dummy variables where there's some issue over multicollinearity, but actually it only shows up in the VIF, not the tolerance. And we've already had a look at the correlation tables and not seen any sort of worrying correlations there. So in this case, we don't. Okay, so what else do we get? We get more collinearity diagnostics. Um, again, which is a table that I, I don't actually use. We sort of, there's lots of different uh, methods and techniques for looking for multicollinearity, but we, we sort of don't use this one. It's, it, it, the, it's, it's quite technical, so it's not, not necessary for actually just performing the analysis. 
and we get um, case-wise diagnostics as well, which um, th if you recall, we 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 requested um, any residuals which were four standard deviations from the mean. So basically, we're looking for outliers using these case-wise diagnostics, and these case numbers are all the cases where the outlier, where where basically the the mark predicted by the model is is very very far from the mark that the individual actually attained. So it might be worth just looking at these cases and just making sure that something as simple as a, an error in data entry hasn't occurred, for example, that someone's put an extra one in or something like this when typing the data in. Um, but it, of course, there, there are always going to be outliers. And in, in this case, when we've got such a large data, you know, the 15,000 cases, you'd expect there to be some which were four standard deviations away from the mean. So um, well, we won't sort of go through the, the task of looking at each of these cases in this video, but it would be worth just possibly having a look at these cases and seeing if there's anything unusual about them, if there have been any mistakes in data entry. Because outliers are obviously, they're very interesting. I mean, you have to question why they, they differ so much from the rest of the population, which um, the rest of the sample, which you draw your model from. Um, got some residual statistics are up there. Um, this is just um again just a, a it's like a descriptive table for the residuals so it just tells you what the you know the mean predicted value mean residual which is obviously this been standardized and sort of the minimum maximum standard deviation that type of thing which can be quite useful okay so finally let's look at some of the charts that we've produced um with the aim of of checking the assumptions of our model so one of the assumptions of course is that the residuals should be normally distributed um, the residuals being sort of the error in the model, if you like, um, the, 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 the difference between what a case actually got in the data set to what the case would be predicted to get by our by our model. Um, we want them to be normally distributed to make sure that sort of there's no systematic variance in the in the residuals, which would suggest there was some sort of bias. And as you can see from this histogram, they are broadly this bell shaped. We've overlaid the um, the, the normal curve over the top of it so for, the, for a direct comparison. And you can see that broadly speaking they are normally distributed but perhaps there's more cases uh, where the residual was the, the, the average residual than perhaps you'd expect. So there's a bit of a cause for concern here. Um, our fears are somewhat allayed about this assumption on the next plot which is the uh, PP plot which basically um, again it, it, it's looking, it's comparing the residuals you've got to what you'd what you'd expect from a normal distribution. So this black diagonal line here is a, represents a normal distribution and what we want is this overlaid line, uh, the red line, to, to to basically map onto it as closely as possible to, to show that our data is also normally distributed. Um, as you can see there are a few sort of little deviations, little kinks in the line but generally I'd say that, that that's, a, you know, that would be a normal distribution that the assumption, assumption hasn't been violated. Um, I should just mention that I've used the chart editor here just to change the colour of things so if it looks slightly different if you do it yourself don't worry I've just tried to emphasise the um, the two lines there. Right finally we get the scatter plot which is a way of t testing for heteroscedasticity which I'm not entirely <laughs> sure I've said right but, but there we go it's a horrible long word. Um, Basically, when we're when we're testing for heteroscedasticity, um, we're hoping that the residuals don't vary systematically with the um, predicted values. So we're we're hoping that, um, for example, the residual the, the 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 model is not particularly accurate, inaccurate at any one level of the predicted value so it might it, you may find sometimes that your model is is highly inaccurate for certain groups of people and it works better um for some groups than others but if if it's the case that um it it the residuals are higher for certain predicted values then that might be a, a problem with the overall model but as you can see this this pattern is actually fairly random you've got more of a focus in the middle here but it is around um, zero and zero, so I, I don't think we have a, a problem with heteroscedasticity with this particular uh, model, which is a good thing. So we can be fairly, again, we can be fairly sure that we've we've built a okay. kit. So overall, we've completed a multiple linear regression to ascertain the extent to which age 11 exam scores, gender, ethnicity, and social economic class can be used to predict age 14 exam scores. 
Um, our model predicts 79.7% of the variance in age 14 exam scores. It explains 79.7% of the variance. And it was suitable for predicting the outcome, as we saw from the F-test. So we, we're fairly sure we've built a good model here. Um, age 11 score was by far the best predictor. Um, but gender, ethnicity, social and ethnic class, um, they all accounted for significant amounts of the variance. So that's it for multiple linear regression now. Um, that's all the videos. There's also obviously this, the website for you to, to explore, which will go into things in a little more depth. But the next set of videos will be about logistic regression. Thanks very much.